Jesus is our living hope. We're staying with that theme even today. He is a living hope even for our nation. You know, the nation is really only as strong as the family. It's only as strong as the family. And that's why uh, the Supreme Court's decisions of recent weeks is in favor of family and life, and that is so good. <clears throat> but a family is only as strong as the married couple. Yeah, it's only as strong as a married couple. And so we're going to turn our attention to a uh, study today. <clears throat> we need Jesus Christ, our living hope, when marriage lacks its luster. Now, my mom baked wedding cakes uh, pretty much for a living. She had a contract with a hall, and she provided all the wedding uh, <clears throat> cakes for the hall that um, would, when a person got the hall, they threw in this cake. My mom would bake it for the hall, and, and it was really pretty good deal that she had going. And on the top was always the bride and the groom. Sometimes they were like birds or bells, or, but usually bride and groom. But I never saw one look like this. Back to back they faced each other, drew their swords and shot each other. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you the whole poem some other time. <clears throat> but all marriages, they, they start out on a good foot because they're in what we call the gaga stage of the relationship. Uh, they call it technically limerence. They're infatuated. And somebody said, I don't, didn't realize that the puppy love would lead to the dog's life. And, uh, <clears throat> but that's where it starts, puppy love. You know, we, we give it all different kinds of names, all right? We give it all different kinds of names. But as time goes on, the, the luster seems to begin to lack and wane. And, and uh, when that happens, you need Jesus Christ, our living hope. So what do you do when your marriage lacks its luster? You see, all marriages will face trouble. That's written in the Bible. He's actually telling in 1 Corinthians, he's telling them <clears throat> that you might want to remain single because the idea that things are going to be happily ever after is not necessarily true because he said, but those who marry will face many troubles in this life. You see, the thing is, most people think they're going to divide all their troubles, so I got somebody else to help me. No, you just inherited all theirs too. <laughs> you just doubled all your troubles, okay? And so he says, this is a statement, you will have trouble in life. And so when, when I have a, a couple in premarital counsel, we go over this. You're going to face difficulties. I make them go through a workbook that works them through all the problem, marriages of, uh, problem areas of a marriage before they ever get married so they know what they're getting into. Good plan. I have a really good track record. You know, I've been doing marriages for a lot of years. And I think there's only been in all of the marriages I've done, like three that have ever ended in divorce. But you see, I make everybody do some homework to know what you're getting into, to know what the other person is like. And we talk about you're going to face trouble. And when you do, you need our living hope, Jesus Christ. So, when Christ, with Christ, you can overcome them. All the difficulties, problems in life, okay? You can overcome even the lack of luster in your marriage. And how can you do that? I know that's a question. How? How? I want to know how. Well, first of all, Peter talks to the wives. He says this, be submissive. Now, that is a nasty word in our vocabulary today. Woo. Be submissive. The word just simply means yield. I'm submissive all the time. I told you a week, a week ago how I got pulled over by a police officer, and the police officer asked for my license, and I immediately gave it to it. I was submissive. I was yielding, right? And then I noticed her purple eyes. I said, my, what lovely purple eyes you have. See how good I pulled that off, you know? And uh, she then told me about her contacts and how she got them and all that, and then she let me off my ticket. Whew. All right, but I yielded, I yielded. And, and that's what this word means, yielded. Jesus yielded to his parents. The God, the creator, Jesus in flesh, he is God come in the flesh, and it says he yielded, he submitted to his pa parents, Joseph and Mary, and he obeyed them, he obeyed them. Man, that's all it means. Give me your license. Here it is. Submissive, submissive. 
Oh, but notice what it says. In the same way. Same way as what? Well, this is in a context. He's already said previously, citizens are to be submissive to their president. He put it this way. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as supreme authority, then he goes on, or to the governor or the local law official. He says, just as you would, you would yield to the governor, the president, whoever, he says, that's how. The second thing he says, hey, as an employee submits to the employer, slaves submit yourself to your masters with all respect. All respect. So he's, he's, he's comparing it. He says, listen, you know, if the government tells us to do something that we are not, pro prohibits us from doing something that we're supposed to do, we have to disobey the government and obey God. If an employer tells us we've got to do something that God tells us not to do, like he's in the room and says, oh, tell them on the phone that I'm not here. Well, he's telling you to lie. You always obey God rather than man. That's just a biblical principle. And even citizens have to, Peter was cast in jail, prison, and, and they beat him and they wanted him to stop preaching. And he said, I have to obey God rather than men. And that's the way this works. He goes on, he says, and as the church does to Christ, so wives are to submit to their husband. He says, now as the church submits to Jesus Christ, so also wives should submit to their own husbands and everything. Did you notice the own on there? Wives only have to yield to their own husband, no one else. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah. There are cases where a wife does not have to submit. You say, well, can you think of one? Oh, sure, I can think of one. If a husband says, hey, listen, we're a little short on cash. You think you could do a little prostitution or raise, raise some money? You have to. You have to disobey that. You have to. If, if, if a husband says to a wife, I want you to quit praying and quit reading your Bible, you have to disobey him. You, you got to. I have to obey God rather than man. It's a biblical principle. It, that is the trump card over everything. But as long as it's not something that's in violation with God or His Word, listen, here's one. I, I run into this all the time. A, a, a wife will say, but my husband doesn't want me to go to church. And so what do I do? Don't I, ha I have to obey my husband, right? No! The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13, he says, do not forsake the assembling of yourself together. Hey, they were being persecuted. And he says, you haven't even gotten to the point of persecution yet where you're shedding blood. You're just getting nasty looks and, and they're, they're taking, confiscating your goods, but you haven't shed a, a drop of blood yet for the cause. He said, get into church. That's what he's saying. There are times when uh, this principle is trumped by, I have to submit to God first. God first. I just want to get clear up the, all the misconceptions about that. He says, be submissive. So what does it mean to be submissive? It's yielding to His will if it does not contradict God's will. Boom. That's it. My sister-in-law tried not to be a nag and was trying to submit to her husband, but uh, it was his role to take out the garbage, and it wasn't hers. And so um, it started to stink, but she wasn't going to nag him, not going to nag him. It really got to stink. Finally, he said, why in the world is this in here? It stinks like crazy. She said, it's your job. <laughs> we have roles spelled out. We're going to see those in this past. Yielding to his will if he does not contradict God's will. Now, she, if he had said, hey, maybe you could take the trash out, but it was his role. He knew it. Right? There's roles laid out. Not only is it yielding to his will that does not contradict God's will, but it's also respecting him. In Ephesians 5.33, it says, And the wife must respect her husband. Not if she wants to. 
but she must. This is really powerful. Most women believe that the husband should unconditionally love her. No strings attached. Not based on performance, not based upon looks, not based on... You just are supposed to love me because I'm your wife, unconditionally. But for some reason, they also believe that I only got to respect him if he performs well. But the Bible says, husbands must love their wives as their own body, and the wife must respect her husband. Respect him. Now, when men were asked, if forced to live with only one of the following, which would it be? To be left alone and unloved, or feel inadequate and disrespected, 74% chose A. I would rather have no love in my life than not be respected. Men prefer respect over love. Wow. Women prefer love over respect. That's why they stay in such terrible situations for so long, always hoping it will change and get better. Because they love, and they want love. They want love, and they're treated so disrespectfully, but they want love. They want love. It's not, the, it's not the men that want the love. The men want the respect, and it's the women that want the love. This is a really important principle to get down. Husbands need to love their wives. Wives need to respect their husband. That's the way. That's the way you submit. You respect your husband. Whether he deserves it or not, you say, well, that's contradictory. How do I respect somebody who's not done anything respectful? If you look hard enough, you'll find something that you can respect, and you can tell him, good job. You see, God made man to work. He derives all of his value and his esteem from what he does. You attack his job or his performance, you cut to the very core of him. For him, that is like you receiving from him a disrespectful statement like, boy, are you fat. You are so ugly. Or you can think of some other worse things, I'm sure. That cut to the heart are painful when you attack him in his manhood and his performance and what he does. How come you can't get more pay like the other men? You're just not wearing the pants around here. And you say that, you destroy. You are so disrespectful. Listen, I know what you're thinking. Okay. Every man wants respect. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, yeah, but it was Aretha Franklin that talked about women wanting respect. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. You want me to sing it for you? You could sing it. But the truth is, she didn't write the song. Otis Redding wrote the song. And Otis Redding wrote the song for his wife. He wanted respect. He wanted respect. He didn't want love. He wanted respect. Women don't want respect. They want love. You're just programmed that way. Women would not say, I can live without love and just give me all the respect in the world. No, women say, I give, I give up the respect. Give me the love. I need love. But the man, I say that's a compliment, one to the other, and that's the way God designed us. That's the way God designed us. You know, the women write most of the, the greeting cards. And on Father's Day, you ever read the Father's Day greeting cards? You can tell a woman wrote it because it's all lovey-dovey. It's all lovey-dovey. The man doesn't want the lovey-dovey. You, you write your own card, and you tell him all the ways you appreciate him. That builds him up. He's on an ego trip, man. It, when you say you, you appreciate and, and you list it, he, he calls that love. You don't, but he does. Man, man, oh, that just pumps him up. Studies show that men are so different from women. <clears throat> when, when guys are hanging out, they'll hang out and they'll say nothing. And then you'll, they'll, they'll go and they'll say, man, we had such a great time. Man, we were at the ballpark. My wife will say, what'd you talk about? Nothing? The game. We're at the game. We're at the game. And we talked about nothing, but, but we connected, man. We got a bond. We die for each other. When women get together, yap, 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 yap. God created us differently. Our culture today doesn't get this. They just don't get this. 
God designed us this way. Men want respect, women want love, and that's what the passage just before this we talked about said. He says, be submissive to your own husband. Why? He says here, that if any of them do not believe the word, they're not Christians, they don't believe the word of God, they have not come to faith, they might be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. It says, show it, don't talk it. He's talking about unbelieving husbands at this point. You're a believer as a wife, and you've got an unbelieving husband. <clears throat> You're nagging and talking and just badgering the poor guy to go to church and all of that. It's, read the Bible, and you're always preaching Jesus in his face. It's not going to work. But if you let the Holy Spirit transform your life, he will Notice, it's like two guys sitting next to each other, not saying a word, but connecting. In his book, Love and Respect, Egg Riches writes about the story of a guy who goes out in the garage and he's working on his car. And his wife comes out and she sits down and talks a little bit, but says, uh, is there a tool I can hand you? And he, oh yeah, get me a three quarters drive. And he, oh, I don't know what that is, he explains. And, and they talk nothing deep, but it turned around the marriage. Because for a guy, just being together is good enough. Good enough. <clears throat> your actions are far more powerful than your words. Your words. Every woman marries hoping she can change the man. <laughs> and every man marries hoping she'll never change. Yeah. If you want to win him, don't badger, don't. State it once. Oh, like my sister-in-law who said, oh, I'm not going to tell you again to take out the garbage. Well, it stinks in here. Well, you're not doing your job. Oh, I better take out the garbage. She didn't badger. Listen. The next thing is, he says, be pure. Wives, not only be submissive, be pure. When they see your purity, every man wants to have a woman who is only all about him. Purity. Purity. And reverence. Now, this word reverence in the in New International Version is actually the exact same word used in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33, for respect. I love that. When they see your purity and, their, and your respectful attitude, you'll win them. That's what the text is saying. You'll win them. you win them. Be respectful. Be respectful. Third thing, be beautiful. You say, wait a minute. It says your beauty should not come from outward adornments such as the braided hair and wearing uh, of gold jewelry and fine clothes. He's saying that's not the primary source of your beauty. Listen, you use that to hook and trap the guy, but after that, after that, once, once, once he's bitten on the bait and, and, and he he's loves you and he's married to you, he doesn't care so much about the outside as he does the inside. It's true. It's true. Instead, it should be, your beauty should be that of your inner self and the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of greater worth in the sight of God. <clears throat> the Harris Poll was paid by Playboy magazine back in the height of the sexual revolution uh, because they were sure that the American male wanted to run around with as many women as they could, and they found that over 74% of the people would rather just be at home with their wives and their kids. So then Playboy tried to suppress the announcement and they put their own spin out and Harris came out and said, no, we've got to correct what they said. The American man is a whole body. He's a homebody. He just wants to go home to a loving wife and his family and he wants to putter around the house or watch a few games on TV. <laughs> yeah. You, you hook them with the beauty, but that external beauty won't keep them. There's got to be something on the inside. There's got to be a connectivity on the inside. A connection. You know what it says? 
It's got to be that gentle and quiet spirit. This is just the opposite of what it says in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 21.9 says this, Better to live on a corner of the roof, flat roof, you know, and they have a parapet around the edge of it so you don't fall over. Better to live on the corner of the roof than to share the house with a quarrelsome wife. (laughs) Now listen to this. That word quarrelsome in King James Version is called a brawling woman. A woman that's constantly fighting with you. She's const- you're constantly having to put up defense shields because she's constantly attacking you, attacking things about you. Uh, listen, if your guy is constantly putting up defense shields, you better check what you're saying. Better check what you're saying, how you're saying it, how you're doing it. Brawling woman. Now, the New American Standard puts up a wife of contention. She's disputing everything you say. You say white, she says black. You say high, she says low. You say the fish was this big, she says this big. You know? The common English version puts a nagging wife. (laughs) Yeah, she's constantly telling you over and over to do the same thing because you're not doing it. And it's kind of like on the inside, okay, you told me once, you told me twice. I'm not going to do it now because I'm going to see how many times you're going to tell me. And you have this crazy cycle of two people who supposedly love each other in conflict, and it goes in a spiral down, 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 where a marriage is losing its luster. But he says, no, be beautiful. He says that gentle, quiet spirit is of great worth in God's sight. He said, never lose focus is not just about the man. This is about doing what the Lord wants you to do. Even if he doesn't respond favorably, you you want the Lord to respond favorably to what you do. Be beautiful, not just on the outside, be beautiful on the inside too. Here's my paraphrase. It's better to live in the garage than to share a house with an unhappy wife. That's the Henderson translation. So my wife's going to tell me, pitch a tent in the garage as soon as I get home. (laughs) Oh, she says she'll put a bed in for me. Yeah. Uh, The thing I love about my wife, we we kind of barb each other. We we pick on each other, and we know it. We banter. I guess that's the word, banter. And, uh, but then I'll say, ooh, that was a good one. And, (laughs) and, uh, but uh, if she didn't, I would think something's wrong. She doesn't love me. But, you know, uh, that's because you'll find out in a few moments uh, as we go through this passage, it's important that a husband understand his wife. Be beautiful, he said, for this way, the holy women in the past who put their hope in God, there's the beauty. A woman who has her hope in God, not in him. Your husband is not God. Don't treat him like it. Treat God as God and him as your husband. They used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husband. There it is again, own. Not to all men, just their own husband. Their own husband. He says, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. I'm not expecting to hear that from my wife. And men, if you're expecting your wives to call you master, not going to happen. In fact, I don't believe Abraham ever heard her call him master either. You see, I've gone back and I read the passage in Genesis chapter 18. In Genesis chapter 18, God comes down to spend some time with Abraham. He comes with two angels, so there's three. They look like men, but the one is God. The text tells us that. So God comes and he visits Abraham and Abraham says, whoa, God's here. I got to provide a meal. So he runs in and he tells his wife, get some dinner ready. God's here. Wow, what would you do if Jesus showed up at your house? And get, a, get a dinner ready. <clears throat> that, that's what he told her to do. You know what she did? She obeyed. She got a dinner ready. God's our guest. Holy smokes. Wouldn't you do that? Absolutely. And so Abraham is out talking with God and the angels, and, uh, and, and God says to Abraham, hey, now you got to realize, Abraham's 99, and Sarah's 89, and God says to Abraham, 
hey, next year when I come back at this time, you're going to have a son. <laughs> Sarah's on the inside of the tent getting everything li- ready, but I know how this is. She's multitasking. She is listening while she's preparing over here. She's listening at the, the, through the tent, and she hears it, and, and it says, next year, at this time, you're going to have a son. <laughs> she laughs. <laughs> and, and, and she laughs, and then she said, so Sarah laughed uh, to herself. No, she didn't do it out loud. See, to herself. And she thought. She thought. This is a thought. This is what she's saying inside. After I am worn out, my master is old. Will I now have this pleasure? (laughs) She didn't say that to him. She didn't call him master. She called him master in her thoughts. You know what this is saying to me? It's all about attitude. It's all about attitude. It's attitude of respect for her husband. The Lord reads her mind. You read the rest of the passage. You say, why did she laugh? She says, oh, I didn't laugh. Oh, yeah, of course you laughed. You're going to be pregnant, and you're going you're to have a son, and a year later she had the son. You know the story. That's the example here. It is profound respect that is on the inside and makes its way on the outside. That's what's going on here. That's what's going on. Now he turns from the wives to the husbands. In Ephesians, the Apostle Paul really rakes over the husbands and only gives a verse or two to the women. Here he's given more verses to the wives and only going to give one verse to the men, but this verse is loaded. It's loaded. Husbands in the same way. What? In the same way? I got here, be submissive. Yeah, you got to be submissive in the same way as what? As a country to its president. As what? As an employee to the boss. As what? As a wife to Christ. Husbands, though, he says, he doesn't use the word submit. He drops that out. He just says, in the same way they're doing that, husbands, in the same way, you have to love your wives. That's in Ephesians when he deals with the same passage, same stuff. You have to, as intensely as she is going to submit, you have to love your wife, and it's a must. It's not optional. It's not if she deserves it. You didn't deserve it when Christ died for you. He loved you when you were unlovely. In the same way as Christ loved the church, You are supposed to love your wives. So how do I do that? Well, this passage tells us. Be considerate as you live with your wife. Be considerate. Now, I'm going to switch translations here. I'm going to go to the English Standard Version because I think it represents the Greek text a little better. It says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. I like that. You have to understand your wife. Whoa, I don't think I'll ever understand the woman I'm living with. (laughs) She's smart. She's witty. Uh, Sometimes I miss the point. She has to clarify it for me. Uh, Am I the only one, guys? Yeah. Uh, She's beautiful. She's she's great. I, I, I love my wife. But the text says I have to live with her in an understanding way. I, I, I am told by God, if I'm going to love my wife, I have to figure out how she ticks. I, I got to know why she behaves the way she behaves, what her abilities are and what they are not. There's a few things my wife is not. She's not an artist. She thinks she's a singer. <laughs> she thinks she's a singer. There's something she really is good at. She is a good, great, awesome grandma. She's really good at connecting with people. I learned a long time ago from the book uh, Five Love Languages. If you haven't read it, you need to read it. I had to figure out which language was hers because if I treated her with the wrong love language, she would not realize that I loved her. But if I treat her in the right love language, she will know. See, that's all about I have to understand her. 
No, I like chocolate ice cream. Let's suppose she's allergic to chocolate ice cream. And I'm going to treat her just like I want to be treated. I would give her chocolate ice cream and she'd break out in hives all over. Well, what good would that be, right? But I have to figure out what she likes. Uh, he's saying here, live with your wives in an understanding way. I was teaching this passage to a group of couples. There were probably 20 couples in the group at the church I was at. And I'm teaching through this passage. And I get to it and I said, okay, I got a question for you guys. How many of you guys here have read a relationship book in the last five years? Do you know how many hands went up? Zero. Zero. And then I said to the ladies, how many of you have read a relationship book in the last five years? They didn't tell me how many. They just blurted out all the titles. All these titles that they had read, boom, 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 boom. You know why? God doesn't tell them to live with a man in an understanding way. They already understand. <laughs> They've read the books. They know the books. Men don't read the books. You know who reads the books? Those that come to my premarital counseling, those come to my counseling sessions. I assign the books and they read them. And then once they've read them, they feel they're experts and they got this topic down pat. Just give me the bottom line. I don't need any more. I got it. But you need to understand. If you don't understand what makes your wife tick, you're going to blow it. Husbands, you have to live with your wives in an understanding way. Watch this. Showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. All this experimentation with transgenderism has proved one real important point. There is a huge difference between the strength of men and women. When a man transitions into a female and enters any sports, he dominates the sport. Because he is stronger, he's bigger, more muscle mass, and I don't care how much drugs you give him unless you're killing him, he is going to win. It's just that way. So when he says, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel, he says, listen, you could break her, but what good is that? You take and you treat her like fine china. You treat her, in, Ephesians says, in a holy way. Holy means you set them apart from everything else that's common. So I set my wife apart like, you know, if, when you have china, you put the china in the china cabinet. And you use all the other plates every day. And then if it's really just your guests coming, you do paper plates, so you just throw them away. <laughs> but you pull out that fine china when it's a special occasion. You treat your wife like she's fine china. She is special. She's different from everyone else. And you protect her. Showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. You protect her. She, since he says, since... They are heirs with you of the grace of life. Heirs with you. He's writing to Christian men about their Christian wives, and he's saying your Christian wife is a co-heir of the gift of eternal life with you if she has Christ as her Savior. Your co-heirs. You treat her as an equal since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. You see, spiritually, being a man does not give you one little edge over her. Doesn't. Often the case is the woman is more spiritual than the man. And she yields to other things, but man, when it comes to your dumbness in the Scriptures, <laughs> she doesn't have to put herself under the stupidity. She puts herself above to God. The Bible says for each one of us to build ourselves up on our most holy faith. It's an individual matter. There's not a wife that's going to be able to stand before God and say, but he didn't lead devotions. It's because nowhere in the Bible does it say you have to have devotion. It doesn't. It's not there anywhere. He didn't take the quiet time. He didn't pray at the meals. He didn't, you're going to stand before God and give account of yourself. And he's not going to be able to say, yeah, but she was always dragging me down. No, no, no. Your spiritual life is your responsibility. Listen, you are just co-heirs of the gift of grace. You are not more important or less important. You are equal in Christ. 
And he's saying, listen, you need, you need to realize that. You might have stronger strength and you might, you might be the one who is supposed to be the loving one and, and you might have all that, but the bottom line is you are not superior. You're just on, the, on God's plane. You're just equal. You're just equal. Now watch what I mean. He says to the men, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Every now and then a man will say to me, man, when I pray, I just feel like I'm not getting through. And the first thing I respond, I say, how are you treating your wife? How are you treating your wife? If you don't treat your wife appropriately, according to biblical standards, your prayers will be hindered. Although the text doesn't say that, I think the reverse is true. When a wife is not being the wife she should be before God, I believe her spirituality and her prayers are hindered. Because the passage begins with likewise. Likewise. Let's go back. This is, this is a reciprocal thing. Marriage is reciprocal. You can have hindered prayers or you can have unhindered prayers depending upon how you treat your spouse. All right, this is the one thing I want to take with you today. And we're back to the wedding cake topper. This wedding, this marriage has lost its luster. But Jesus is our living hope. And when we draw near to the Lord and we do our part in the Lord and we're living a married life for the Lord, then things will change. All right, but my clicker stopped clicking, Bob. Just advance. Ah, oh, there we go. If you have Jesus as your living hope, he will bring the luster back. And that's exactly what I think everyone really, truly wants. They want luster in their relationship. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so very thankful for your word. It instructs us in every facet of life. Our nation will only be as strong as our families, and our families only as strong as our marriages. Help us, O oh God, on this 4th of July weekend to realize that building a strong marriage begins with us who are married to have strong married lives. Bless our marriages. Bless this church family. Bless those, Lord, who are single, whether widowed or divorced or just never married. Uh, Lord, uh, we know that that life can be tough alone, that it can be a lot worse if they're married to the wrong person. And so, God, we pray that your will will be done in every single person's life, that they'll know the standards by which to select a partner and how we are to respond once we're married. We are to love our wives, and wives are to respect their husbands. Help us do that, we pray in Jesus' name.